Thank you for joining the SIPS Queensland branch webinar on the topic of Unchaining Modern Slavery, kindly sponsored by Inform365. My name is Shane Duran and I'm the SIPS Queensland branch committee member. We're delighted to be able to connect procurement and supply professionals from all over the world. So thank you for joining us today. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Jagara people and the Turrbal people, the traditional custodians of the land on which I present from today. We pay our respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. For our New Zealand attendees, tēnā katoa, tēnā katoa, tēnā katoa katoa. For those who don't know us, the Chartered Institute of Procurement and Supply, or SIPS, is your global professional body for procurement and supply professionals, dedicated to promoting best practice, continuous improvement in professional standards, and raising awareness of the contribution that procurement and supply management can make to organisations. We have close to 200 registered attendees today, people from all over the region and further afield. I'm delighted to be welcoming and representing the professional body as the committee member for SIPS Queensland Branch. So to all attendees, a very warm welcome. Before we begin, just a few housekeeping notices. I'd like to advise everyone that this webinar is currently being recorded and will be made available to all members the following week. All attendees have been muted during the presentation. However, we do ask that you utilise the Q&A box to write any questions you may have for the presenter and panel, and we look forward to answering as many of your questions during the Q&A session at the end. We also have the chat button available for you to utilise by making general comments that you'd like to share with all the attendees. We will have a poll question during the webinar, so please participate as we'd love to hear your views. Now, before we begin, just a few words from our sponsor today, Nicholas Bernhardt from Inform365. Thank you. Apologies for that, because Shane, you were cutting out quite a bit there, but I think all good now. Hopefully you guys can hear me now loud and clear. So I'm just going to put things in context and just give you a little bit of an idea why we're actually sitting here. And so I just prepared a few slides and I just wanted to put the numbers that we're talking about a bit more in perspective. So um, the most acknowledged or respected number out there is that there's 14 million people on this planet. There's, there's 14 million people on this planet that are trapped in some kind of form, form of forced labor. Now, put that in perspective as well. Um, it's the second largest criminal industry in the world. And my Friday joke typically would be after politics, but obviously it isn't politics. It is uh, drugs, which is the largest criminal industry in the world. But the 40 million, I just want to sort of dr drill down on that one a little bit further, uh, whether that is really the number. So 40 million actually means one, roughly one in 200 people on this planet are in some a form of slavery, but is that the actual number? And just to highlight that, um, some of you may have seen um, just recently that the UK revised its number, its guesstimate from 10,000 to 100,000 slaves. So it's not a factor of 5%, 10%. This is a factor of 10 where they've gone from 10,000 to 100,000. And maybe to drill down even more, I, I, I like sharing a story of someone that was involved or, or was affected by this. This is a story of James. James lived in Ghana at the age of six. He was sold by his dad uh, uh, at the age of six, trafficked with five other boys, of which three died and three lived. He worked 3 a.m. to 8 p.m. every single day, and he was regularly beaten, fed once a day if he was lucky, no medical care, and he escaped at the age of 13, and now he's dedicated his life to helping people that are in vulnerable slave-like situations. Uh, I've got a daughter myself, she's eight, and the mind boggles what went through um, even the dad's mind when he decided uh, he had to sell his son into slavery. But I'll, I'll, I'll leave that just as food for thought. But just wanted to flag one other thing, and that is when you're looking at modern slavery, it's a really good opportunity to review your supply chain in a broader picture and start thinking about, do I want to track some environmental aspects of my suppliers? Do I want to track local procurement, social procurement, indigenous procurement, and the like? Uh, and so we've got a tech solution that helps companies um, track and monitor any kind of ESG related um, aspects. Here's just some of the um, 
recent solutions. We just launched a shared solution for an entire industry in the modern slavery space. We launched it last October and that was with the Property Council of Australia. And we've got uh, Aaron from Cole, so I thought uh, I'd happily put up their landing page as well with very recognizable Cole's colors. Uh, and last but not least, that, that's me. I'm the CEO of Inform365. We're an Australian company and we're just going to quickly run a poll now. And the question in that poll is, does your organization have to report on modern slavery? And the three answer options are yes or no, but we're voluntarily reporting or no, we're not submitting a report. Uh, so there we go. Thanks everyone for joining and hopefully this will be a very informative session for everyone. Thank you. Well, thank you, Nicholas. That poll's coming through. 72%. So I think Nicholas, you take that down and I'm up. Welcome everybody. And um, Welcome to uh, the members of the Chartered Institute of Procurement and Supply, and thanks, Shane. And I know you were breaking up there a bit, so I think I should probably just remind everyone that there are 200,000 members uh, of uh, SIPs worldwide and 5,000 in Australia and New Zealand. And uh, as an investor and entrepreneur, I'm really happy about that because um, it may interest you why I got involved in this whole area. But it occurred to me, particularly when living in the States, that uh, a transparent supply chain was essential uh, to not only a, a sustainable planet, but to an ethical and viable society. And it's often, because it's behind the scenes, overlooked. Um, you know, toxins was the thing that interested me first in so many manufacturing processes, again, particularly in the States. And um, those of you who've seen the movie uh, Dark Waters, um, you'll know about, you know, something as simple as a frying pan with the uh, PFOA in it and, you know, I always thought nonstick frying pans were, you know, really cool. Uh, and I remember growing up with them, um, only to find out that uh, many of them were not safe. And, and so transparent supply chains, very important. And today, whilst we're going to focus on modern slavery, it's all about sustainability, carbon footprint. Um, and, you know, the most interesting thing is it's not just about boards not waking up at night and knowing what's in their supply chain. Um, but transparency has to do with consumers. And it might interest you to know that I'm an investor in the US in a business that is developing algorithms that will steer consumers away from things that they, through their social media footprint, have designated they're not interested in, which means translated in plain English, if you have a company or a product and you have something in your supply chain that you don't know about and that isn't positive, your consumers will find out about it. If they don't find out about it consciously, these algorithms will steer them away from things or flag things and say, hey, did you know that, you know, there's a lot of MSG in this food product or blah, blah, blah. And more seriously, obviously, issues to do with modern slavery. So that's why I think transparent supply chains is not only ethical and sensible, but it will make the world a better place. That's why I'm involved with Nicholas and Inform365. And that's why I'm really happy that all of you who are members of SIPs and those interested in in the supply chains are active and listening and engaged. Um, we're going to have a 10 minute of questions at the end. So obviously feel free to put your questions in after each speaker. Um, and, you know, from now uh, on, I'm going to move on to the panel and, uh, and introduce our first speaker, uh, Renee Yeager. Uh, she's Group Corporate Affairs Man uh, Manager at, uh, at NIB, uh, a uh, very major private health insurer here in Australia, for those of you who are overseas. Um, and she's certainly focused on media, external communications and, and uh, investor relations. But her role involves responsibility for leading NIB's modern slavery efforts to ensure compliance to this new legislation, whilst also taking a best practice approach, which you know, obviously makes sense. We, these laws are, are there to, uh, to make sure uh, great transaction, uh, serious transgressions, transgressions don't happen. But more importantly, we all are striving towards best practice. That's ultimately what it's about, uh, and about being the best that we can be, as opposed to having to do things just because the law says so. Anyway, over to you, Renee, to discuss the challenges facing 
NIB and uh, in modern slavery and how you are tackling those changes. Awesome, thank you and welcome everyone. Um, so I'll get straight into the presentation. So this is our first year at NIB um, reporting under the Modern Slavery Act as with many other companies. Um, we haven't previously done a voluntary statement. So for us, this was um, really sort of getting back to basics in terms of getting the baseline correct. And so I thought I would get started with our approach. Um, so just quickly touching upon three of the key elements that I think um, worked really well for NIB to date and may provide some learnings to the group. Um, so firstly, it was just creating a really solid roadmap to compliance. Um, as much as everyone hates the word journey, to me, this is a journey that we're on, especially for a number of reporting entities who may not have um, had as much focus on this to date. Um, so I think understanding that this is a longer process and establishing those realistic timelines that allow you to comply with the new legislation, um, but also take that best practice approach. So one of the key things that we've identified is just having that really clear project plan. And we also established a working group so that we can drive that progress across the group and tap into def different sources of expertise across the group as well. Um, we've also then reached out to engage with experts as well as other stakeholders to share learning. So as mentioned, and a lot of us are just starting on this journey, um, and it's been really helpful to talk to other reporting entities, other businesses who are in this same space, um, which is a perfect example of this webinar in terms of actually sharing learnings. In terms of creating that solid baseline, um, what we did was just go through all of our current policies and procedures and make sure that they had the right um, human rights and modern slavery provisions and inclusions within those. Um, we also then looked to update all of our contractual arrangements um, to make sure they reflected these. And also just try to look at it from the current frameworks that we had and so that we had alignment across our risk management and any of our compliance structures. So rather than sort of starting afresh, trying to make sure it was part of what the business does as a whole. Um, as mentioned previously, um, we really did want to take that best practice approach, um, but we've also taken a risk based approach. So noting that we have a large number of suppliers um, so that we can actually work with the high risk or very high risk initially and move our way through the supply chain. Um, because we're really focused on making this more than just a compliance um, activity, we want to make sure it's the right thing to do and that we're doing the right thing by the community um, as well as meeting our business and legislative needs. Um, we've also aligned that with our company values and culture um, and as well as those stakeholder expectations. So as a listed company, we have um, stakeholders from including our investors that have expectations around ESG and around our modern slavery reporting, um, but also through to the community. So making sure that we're doing the right thing by the community, by our members. Um, one of the best ways that we've also done this is in terms of creating an industry consortium. So by joining with all of the other health funds um, to actually share those learnings and look at it from an industry approach, given that we're all working in the same space, um, it made sense to kind of come together, noting competition laws, of course, um, but just to come together and say, how can we build on this and as an industry really make a difference um, in this space. Some of the key challenges and learnings that I think could be helpful to share um, was definitely getting the right people on the bus. Um, as everyone would have, there's a number of competing business priorities um, and often resourcing is tight. Um, so it's about making sure that you're identifying the right stakeholders across the group to help you manage the project and have this become BAU because we don't want this to be a set and forget. Um, so getting those right people, getting them engaged um, and having those people support you in doing what you need to do to be compliant and also make sure you're taking that best practice approach. Um, for us, there was also quite a steep learning curve in terms of making sure that we completely understand our obligations, um, making sure that we have the right systems in place to protect human rights. And we've also become quite uh, an internal expert and educator on this process. So helping the rest of the business understand why this is really important, why it's the right thing to do, um, and also how to go about that. Um, one of the other pieces was working smarter and not harder. So initially when we started to look at doing our risk assessment, um, we were doing it manually. This proved to be quite um, an extensive process um, given the sheer number of suppliers that we had. Um, and to ensure we had that consistency and that we could do that assessment fully, we actually ended up partnering with Inform365 to help us 
undertake that assessment um, based on country and industry risk um, so that we could take every space approach and we could set ourselves um, that timeline of saying, okay, let's target the high risk people first and then move down the line as well. So looking at breaking it into those smaller tasks so that it doesn't become overwhelming because I think at the heart of everyone is wanting to do right um, by our people, by our members, by our suppliers and those that they hire. Um, and it can be a little bit overwhelming when you're looking at this as a whole to think how we're gonna get there and how we're gonna make sure this is um, completely watertight. And I suppose it's just making sure that you can keep that manageable by breaking it into those smaller tasks and utilising technology and utilising other frameworks that you already have to kind of build upon that. Um, and then the last point I think um, has been really interesting is actually supporting our supply chain. So there isn't necessarily a strong understanding of both the modern slavery legislation and what modern slavery is generally um, out there in the public or out there in our supply chain that we've found. So we've been that educator for them as well um, in terms of helping them understand what does this mean? Um, no, it doesn't mean that we're necessarily gonna turn off our contract with you. We wanna help you improve your practices um, and help you ensure that you're providing the right um, environment for people to work in, um, as well as being able to meet any requirements that we have as a business. So it's working in partnership with them, um, not necessarily coming down with a heavy stick um, and saying, we're gonna, you know, if you don't meet this by this exact date, we're gonna turn you off. Um, how can we work with you um, so that we can collectively, you know, take on this very large task in terms of trying to reduce the risk that we have around modern slavery. Um, so I'm not sure if you want to do any questions now, um, otherwise I'm happy to take some at the end as well. Well, thank you, uh, Renee. We're going to get everyone questions in the box. Uh, there'll be opportunities for everyone to, to do that, to put the questions up there, and then we can, uh, we can come back to those, I think, as a group. But that's great. Um, a very positive framework, um, which I think others can follow. Uh, and I love the idea that you you've set the framework around positive indicators where you're helping your supply chain get to where they need to go as opposed to wielding the big stick. Uh, a very sensible approach and I think, you know, great for your brand. So thank you very much, Renee. Uh, I'm now going to switch to our new uh, next speaker, Aaron Hill, who's Group Ethical Sourcing Manager at Coles. I just want to repeat that. His title is Group Ethical Sourcing Manager at Coles. I think that deserves an accolade just there because, um, you know, that title kind of says it all uh, around what we're trying to achieve here in transparency and supply chain. Aaron's going to share with us how Coles have been partnering to submit their modern slavery statement and what they see as the key areas to address. So without further ado, Aaron, please join us. Thank you, Andrew. I um, am <laughs> great introduction as well, although I, I, uh, I, I I question uh, how much weight that title holds. The risk uh, is very large, I guess, uh, with a title like that. But just for the benefit of everyone on the call, um, a bit of background, I guess. Um, my Before joining Coles, I've, I've had a few years behind me with regards to supply chain management, especially around ethical sourcing and social compliance. Uh, so prior to uh, Coles, I was at West Farmers in the industrial sector. Um, and then ZX prior to that. So my my I've been very fortunate in my career to be exposed to a number of different supply chains, um, industrial, apparel, uh, food, uh, transport, telecommunications, you name it, um, banking, which was an interesting one, as well as airlines and aeronautics. Um, so with that comes a host of scenario based um, learning points which have have kind of shaped my career and and really allowed me to bring that expertise into Coles. Um, from a Coles perspective when we're talking about that title and, and the remit um, as a business we're you know super um, aligned to ensuring that we um, abolish all forms of modern slavery but also kind of pinpoint and address human rights as a whole across our entire supply chain. Um, you know, most people know us for Coles as, as the supermarket chain that we are. We have um, an express arm of our business, which if you 
get fuel from Coles Express. That's that's a facet of, of our business, Coles Liquor. Um, you know, we have a whole business dedicated to, to spirits and alcohol, um, as well as um, a whole exporting side to our, our um, and ultimately with operations like that, um, there's a whole workforce behind the transportation and delivery of product. Um, all of the services that we use to, uh, you know, keep our business afloat, cleaners, um, electricians, gardeners, building maintenance, um, the list really is is very comprehensive and and puts forward a very interesting portfolio to, you know, paint a picture of what risk looks like for for us as a retailer, particularly to our leadership team. Um, we're very fortunate that um, an understanding of the social compliance issues in our supply chain, not only here in Australia but offshore, is very well. Um, known throughout our full business, even at our board. Our board are very engaged and, and understand at a granular level um, some of the challenges that our supply chain faces, whether that's working hours in China or um, access to qualified auditors in Australia. There's, it's never a dull day at Coles. Um, I guess that's, that kind of feeds into some of the things that I wanted to talk about. I didn't really prepare slides. Um, I was hoping that, you know, through the power of conversation, there'll be some really strong questions that come through around some of the things that we kind of discuss. But there are a couple of points that I, I really wanted to raise and discuss. Um, education, communication and engagement, which I've got in one bucket, and then approach. Um, education is a, is a really big one. Um, this is a message that I've kind of carried through my career around the importance of ensuring that every single touch point in your business understands the why. Why as a business are we doing this? Why are we asking our supply partners to provide this information or, or conduct these assessments? Um, and the reason being is it's not just your procurement or your quality teams that need to understand the message. Because generally, if you're talking about supply chain management and you have a significantly large supply and you're asking them to undertake a social compliance assessment for the first time, um, you've explained the reasoning. Um, generally, they'll say, yes, yes, yes. The first person they're going to call is their contract manager or their relationship manager. Now, if that person doesn't have the same level of understanding and, and the backing of the reasoning about why the business is taking that approach, you can almost see a little bit of a dent in your armor. Um, and I think what's really important when we're talking about these issues and, and asking our suppliers to come on board and go through this journey with us is we're not saying that you're doing the wrong thing. And that's, that's a really key point and something that Renee pointed out as well is these assessments aren't to say, you know, we're going to terminate our contract with you because you're giving us transparency. It's about, okay, what are the areas that we need to improve on um, as a supplier to Coles? What does that look like? Um, do you abide by all the, the laws relative to um, where you operate in the country that... Um, you know, the laws that you need to abide by, whether or not that's Australia, offshore, um, and how do we help you understand what those laws are and, and how do we also, you know, guide you to ensure that you meet the right requirements. Those are the real functional conversations that we're having every day. Um, and the only way that we are successful in that is by ensuring that each touch point that a supplier has, if they do have a question or they... Um, you know, are testing the waters with us as a business is to understand and make sure that we have one message. It's a unified message that any touch point or any supplier with our company understands that this is a critical part of doing business with Coles um, or any business and, um, you know, ensuring that they're on the journey and if they need help that they ask for it. Um, but never allowing, um, I guess, any confusion or understanding that you know this isn't a this isn't a priority um that's that's probably a key part so education internally um from a coles perspective we run um, online sessions we run regular sessions with our procurement teams um and that's a an ongoing subject of learning and development in our business um as we start to 
mature in our program. I mean, Coles have been on this program for a number of years. Um, the level of understanding of non-conformities within our supply chain is, has skyrocketed. I'm regularly impressed by the um, our team's ability and want to understand the granular information around the issues that they're experiencing, even if that's not their core role, um, because everyone is looking to help support and give better education to our suppliers to ensure that one, they understand the issue, two, two, they close those things out effectively and learn and implement change to prevent any kind of concerns going forward, but three, to really make them a, a stronger supplier because um, ultimately that's what we're doing through our program is, is, you know, creating better environments for the workers that we engage as part of sourcing products or services. Um, and then the second piece that I kind of wanted to highlight is just around approach. Um, something that I've kind of picked up in my career over the last few years, um, which is an interesting thing for me, and, and I hope there's interest in it for you as well, is around the fact that, um, you know, one size approach doesn't necessarily fit all. Um, and that's something really, which is quite hard to explain and articulate um, in some scenarios. Um, just because you have an approach and an assessment program that suits, you know, one type of supplier that may provide you with a product doesn't necessarily mean that that approach is going to be effective for a cleaning service provider or a transport and logistics company. Um, and really being able to take a step back and look at all of the key points within that is, it can be challenging um, and, and, and a way to articulate to your, you know, your management team or your peers around the fact that we've built this amazing program and now that we're starting to expand and look at other risks, um, that there is a possibility that we will have to build a different approach. Um, that can be scary for some people, um, but at the same time, it's not something to turn your nose away from either. It's being open to the fact that, you know what, we may have to do something else. If we're serious about this issue, does the assessment criteria that we've built for, you know, pool A actually apply to pool B? And if not, how do we adapt and, and make those changes to ensure that from a risk assessment perspective, we're capturing the right risks? and that our immediate remediation approach is applicable to that type of supplier. So those are some of the, the key things that I thought I would, I would kind of touch on. Um, obviously open to questions as we kind of go through. Um, but yeah, I, I hope that there's been some little nuggets of information within that that um, have provided some kind of insight into what we do, um, but also some of the experiences that I've had and hopefully those are helpful for you too. So I will pass back to Andrew. Thank you very much, Aaron. That was great. And um, for those of us who obviously understand how large coals and your major competitors are, it's great to hear the, the one size doesn't fit all approach because I think sometimes suppliers in the supply chain dealing with large companies get worried that they're going to be uh, maybe bogged down with a bunch of bureaucracy that doesn't apply to them. And, and I think having a sensitivity to that is, is a great example. And give my regards to Stephen Kane, you know, an ex-venture retailer venture capitalist. I like the fact that he's, uh, he's now CEO of Carl's, doing a good job. Don't forget everybody, uh, questions for Aaron, stick them in the chat box so we can compile that and all come back as a, as a panel and, and uh, certainly address any questions related to Aaron's presentation, but thank you. Uh, our last speaker, third uh, speaker, and last but not least, uh, is Dr. Lu Ting Ting. Um, and uh, she's at Griffith University uh, as a lecturer, but I'm, I'm reading from uh, an amazing background. Prior to joining Griffith University, she works as an associate professor at the School of Economics and Management, Beijing Yaitong University. Um, and she's uh, really focused on construction, uh, procurement, public-private partnerships where governments and private enterprise get together and construction supply risk, supply chain management risk. Amazing, a combination of a civil engineer and a doctor of philosophy. I, uh, I'm looking forward to hearing from us. So without further ado, please welcome Ting. Thank you so much, Andrew. Thank you so much, Andrew, for your introduction. I may want to share my screen.
<laughs> great. Thanks. Thank you so much, Andrew, for your introduction. And thanks for this great opportunity to present some of my research findings on combating modern slavery in the construction industry. Um, a little bit uh, about myself. Um, uh, my name is Ting Ting. I am a lecturer from the School of Engineering and Built Environment, Griffith University. Uh, I did my PhD on the innovative construction procurement methodologies at the University of Auckland, New Zealand. After working in Beijing as an academic for five years, I joined the Griffith University early last year. Uh, my area of expertise lie in construction procurement systems and supply chain management and social sustainability considerations and issues in construction projects and construction businesses. So in today's presentation, I would like to first highlight the vulnerability of the construction industry to modern slavery risk. After that, I would like to talk about some key challenges associated with addressing modern slavery in construction. And at last, I would like to elaborate on some good practices and learnings extracted from international experiences, mainly in the, U mainly the UK, UK experiences. Right, before we go any further, I would like to present some key facts and statistics about modern slavery in construction. So globally, around 7% of the workforce is employed by the construction industry in Australia. And the number is bigger in Aust sorry, in Australia, the number is bigger. According to the recent statistics, in 2019, over 1.15 mil million people are employed in construction, which represents about 9% of all jobs in Australia. So according to a recent report re released by KPMG, about 18% of modern slavery victims are found in, in construction. At least 20% of the forced labor victims are found in manufacturing and production of raw materials for construction projects. So those are the key suppliers for the construction. And building materials are often sourced from those high-risk geographies, which are usually associated with poor working conditions and forced labor. It's quite surprising to see that in the European Union, in EU countries, construction ranks the second only to the sex industry as the sector most prone to exploitation. Here comes the question, why the current business model in construction makes it highly vulnerable to modern slavery? A high proportion of labor in the construction industry comes from a low skilled workers with high social economic vulnerability. So this group of people are particularly at a high risk of being the victims of debt bondage or forced labor. So you guys know that uh, construction has a ongoing skills kind of crisis and migrant people, migrant workers at all kinds of skill levels are filling the skills gap. The construction industry heavily relies on those migrant labor. So even when the migrants may have a legitimate right to work in Australia, such as temporary working visa, their migrant status can still contribute to the exploitation practices. And due to the COVID-19 pandemic, there is now a high unemployment rate and many people lost their jobs. So in post COVID period, I can see that will be a more investment putting into the construction and infrastructure projects and the vulnerability and the vulnerability of these worker groups would be even more exacerbated. So because people will choose to work no matter what kind of working conditions are offered. All right, and business models in the construction industry tend to be heavily based on outsourcing and uh, subcontracting. So it's actually not surprising to see hundreds of work streams to be associated with one construction project. And there is a low visibility of con and control over the recruitment and employment practices of suppliers and subcontractors. 
And for those low tier suppliers that they may operate in a high risk countries with low regulated environments, low levels of education and low levels of public awareness. So for those major contractors, they really you know, rely on outsourcing and tiers of subcontractors to reduce their financial risk. So, and this creates an intense competition leading to a lowest cost kind of tendering. So the tier one construction contractors complain that they are very lucky if they can get like two or three percent margin, margins. But you can imagine the margins can become even tighter with those every subsequent layer of subcontracting. So with the introduction of Modern Slavery Act to Australia, like businesses in other sectors, the business in construction with a consolidated revenues of more than $100 million are required to submit an annual modern slavery statement. So in accordance with these legislative requirements, reporting entities in construction will need to disclose their structure, operations, and uh, supply, supply chains. They will also need to report on their approach to identify and manage modern slavery risk in their operations and supply chains. So since the Modern Slavery Act is very new to Australia, to Australia. It seems, um, you know, it's, it remains unknown whether the reporting entities in construction will or to what extent will comply with the legislative requirement. What will be the key challenges or issues? Okay, so in the UK, the Modern Slavery Act came into effect in 2015. So far, there are a few cycles of reporting done, and it really makes sense to see what other challenges and our international counterpart has faced and derive useful lessons or learnings for Australia. So according to a survey conducted in the UK, 30% of reporting entities complete a modern slavery statement, which shows that the level of awareness is still quite low. Although some companies submit their statements, but it's more like a tick box kind of actions rather than conducting a systematic due diligence of their operations and supply chains. And there is a strong evidence that, oops, and there is a strong evidence that training is a good way to raise the skills and competencies in fighting modern slavery. However, the construction lags well behind other sectors on training. So compared to an a, a average level of 41%, and only 26% of companies in construction have provided training to their employees and suppliers on their modern slavery risk and compliance. And there is a tendency that large organizations are pushing risk to their less well resourced a suppliers. So some organizations, they, you know, adopting a like a zero tolerance approach to modern slavery into their contracts. So they treat one incidence of modern slavery as a, a sign of, you know, the breaching their contract and as a reason to terminate a uh, business relationship. This kind of approach is not going to solve the problem. It's more likely to push the problem underground. And risk assessment has become kind of buzzword already now, and a number of methods have been adopted to uh, conduct the risk assessment. However, to what extent the risk assessment it will be translated into policies, procedures, and actions is still a question mark. One of the industry responses to the Modern Slavery Act has been an increase in auditing for labor as well as the materials. So we know that auditing is a very important tool for benchmarking, building more knowledge and raising standards. However, now many companies are just undertaking one off audits, but you know, without realizing that this is an ongoing issue which need continuous diligence checks. So now I would like to highlight some good practices and learnings based on international experiences, which may offer great values to our Australian construction businesses. 
So in light of the legislative requirements of Modern Slavery Act, many leading construction companies have taken a, a number of initiatives to address modern slavery in their operation and supply chains. For example, companies such as Skanska and Landlease, who are the leading construction companies in the world, they have reviewed and augmented their internal ethical policies such as the supply code of conduct and procurement policy and incorporate, uh, to incorporate modern slavery concerns. And some of them try to improve their procurement practices to be aligned with the international standards such as ISO 22400. So some companies realize the importance of setting up an effective governance and organizational reporting structure around modern slavery, uh, such as you know, involving the staff from different departments and clearly define their roles and responsibilities. And companies based in the UK highlight the importance of collaborating with other buyers, NGOs or trade unions to identify the modern slavery risk and to ensure that remediation efforts to take place. Some construction, com some construction companies place much emphasis on supply chain engagement. For example, Skanska built a sustainability KPIs into their performance evaluation of their, of their own procurement team. And also they place higher emphasis on the behaviors and collaboration skills in their selection criteria, as opposed to the commercial criteria. And some companies engage with a procurement or supply chain consultancy, such as Oculus, to develop and implement a worker engagement survey or conduct worker interviews to see if there are any potential modern slavery risks. Skanska use an online platform, such as M site for security and electrical system, which checks the validity of the construction skills certification scheme cards. For example, checking if they have the right to work. So at the end of my presentation, I would like to talk a little bit more about the pro research projects going on at the Griffith University. So by uh, working very closely with the industry, we try to develop a methodology to assess the readiness of the construction businesses for combating modern slavery in their operations and extended supply chains. And here, I would like to send my uh, invitation to our industry colleagues to participate in my research. And we are really keen to solicit your insights and perspectives. So thank you so much. And I'm really looking forward to our following discussion. So if any industry colleagues are interested in this topic and our research, these are my contact details. I can't wait for our following discussions. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ting Ting. Um, amazing command of English. You've done, done so well. I, I'm heading to Griffith University. I don't know about anyone else. That was very exciting. <laughs> really appreciate it. And lots of, uh, lots of good insights, particularly in construction, which, as you say, I, I had a lot to do in uh, Dubai and Abu Dhabi and saw the dark side of the construction industry there with so many uh, uh, workers from the Indian subcontinent who were just being totally exploited. So I've seen that up close and personal, and it's not pretty. Um, okay, well, thank you uh, to the panel. We're going to open it up now for questions. I did mislead a few people and said, put your questions in chat. I meant Q&A, but that's okay. You know, um, When you get to my age, things you, you forget. I mean, what can I say? But uh, more importantly, I'm going to kick off the first question because there's a great question in here from Nicole Simon in Q&A, and we're going to kick off. And I'd like uh, Renee and Aaron perhaps to respond to this, maybe 60 seconds each. How do you balance pressure from the finance side of the business to deliver cost savings and shortened lead times in order to affect meaningful and sustainable changes that the businesses are willing to adopt in order to reduce reliance on an unethical channel? So that old chestnut, not just in modern slavery, but in all areas of transparency and supply chain of balancing the ethical and moral dilemma with the pressure of financial performance. So can I ask uh, Aaron and uh, Renee to perhaps comment on that? Maybe Renee first. Hi, thanks. Um, yeah, I think it is a definite um, balance 
Um, I think one of the ways that we can look to do that is to make sure that our procurement practices and policies are actually reflective of what we're trying to achieve from an ESG sustainability or modern slavery space. I think it's a really key call out to say that, you know, we can do all of these assessments, we can work with our partners um, and suppliers to try and protect human rights, but we can't then expect them to deliver within ridiculous timeframes or at substantially lower costs. I think we have to actually ask ourselves, you know, what is that um, objective actually achieving if we're going to be setting those tight timeframes and costs and actually, you know, as a business accept that we may pay a little bit more, we may accept a little bit longer time frame um, for that trade off, which is protecting human rights, which I think is really important. And then I'll um, jump in there. Thanks, Renee. I think um, the key question is is really now, well, what is the cost of compliance and what is the cost of not doing these assessments and not engaging suppliers um, or engaging suppliers who don't take this seriously? From our perspective, um, it is an educational approach because the balance of the risk that we run um, with a you know, a Coles branded item or our own branded item in the media or wherever that has human rights issues um, that affects much more than just us being able to purchase that product. It, it impacts, um, you know, the consumer's trust and wanting to buy from us as a retailer, but it also looks at, you know, well, what is the impact of us from an, even an environmental perspective down the track? If you are engaging in suppliers offshore in, say, China, where the government is cracking down on environmental performance um, and closing factories without a word of a, of a notice because they're not meeting their environmental performance, what's the cost to you then? So we've really engaged our procurement team as well as the rest of our business to actually address these types of issues up front. All new suppliers are aware that, you know, to be a supplier of coals, you need to meet the required standards um, because you do run the risk not only for us but as your own business of, coming into challenges that will impact being a long-term supplier to coals. From an um, existing supplier perspective, it's all about this is a requirement and this is how we um, are going to bring you on the journey. We recognise that, you know, we may have be been working with you for two decades and there's a whole bunch of new things that you may not be aware of, particularly from a local aspect. Um, but again, it's the same challenge. How do we ensure that all of our suppliers understand what risk is with not going through these types of assessments um, and ensuring that they aren't aligning themselves to best practices and really owning that themselves. It's not a Coles requirement or a customer requirement. It's a supplier requirement to be the best that they can be to ensure that everyone is protected, whether that's people or the environment. Mm, that's great. Thank you for that. Uh, I have another question from Colin DeFay. I'm broadening it a bit. She mentions Coles, but I think it's a good question for uh, any of the panel, which is because we're global, uh, a global supply chain uh, is inevitable. How do you balance the in-country laws that we're fundamentally dealing with in the supply chain with obviously uh, Australian, the Federal Act, I guess specifically in relation to modern slavery. But I think it's a good general question because in your global supply chain, you're balancing local country supply constraints with the, is, is there a framework that you use to a, arrive at, at the right uh, answer to that question? Who'd like to go first? Ting Ting, do you have a comment on yeah. that or is it? Uh, um, well, no, yeah. maybe Aaron, you, you go in first, given it. Yeah. <laughs> go on. Yeah, so um, not only Coles, but for a number of companies that I've worked across, alignment to the ETI base, base code as a national international standard is definitely something that we've aligned to. Um, and when we're talking about local laws and how they apply, um, it's exactly that. Um, when we're aligned to the ETI base code or the local law that the suppliers are operating in, we take the path that is, or that benefits the worker the most. Um, obviously, that's, that becomes challenging when you're dealing with an offshore scenario, uh, particularly when overtime hours and things are, are a key factor. Um, and it, it is an interesting part to ensure that um, you're not uh, um, introducing rules 
that impact a social norm that are actually beneficial to the people that are conducting that work. It can be very interesting and challenging as coming from an established Western country to think that, well, someone working that amount of working hours is unacceptable, when in reality, they're doing that, you know, voluntarily to provide the best outcome for their friends and family that they support. Um, and it's taking a step back from the view of the law as the letter of the way and actually understanding, okay, what is best and what is the cultural norm? And then is that appropriate for what we're asking them to do? And it, and it requires being agile um, and really listening to your supply chain, particularly when a workforce is, required, was, is in question around, you know, what is best practice? It's not necessarily what's global best practice. It's what's best practice for the people in that area. And are we giving them the best benefits possible? Ting Ting, any comment on that? Balancing yeah, global is, and local? Yeah, I agree with uh, Aaron that, that a for like, like maybe by the uh, Modern Slavery Act's definition, like so if this is like a, uh, a human ex uh, rights exploitation practices um, in Australia, it may not be are treated as a modern slavery practices in other countries such as maybe China, mm. uh, India. So it's really, I think it's more about like it comes to a culture thing when this uh, comes to these differences between the uh, different legislation and uh, cultural social norms in different countries. And I think it's really important that, you know, like the for companies, especially, I think in every uh, sector to have a maintain a good, build up good relationships and maintain good relationships with their suppliers you know, to understand more about their cultural norms and their social norms. Yeah, that's good. Cool. Thank you. Thanks. And in the end, you know, everybody on the planet knows what's the right thing, don't we? We all know that. It's a fundamental thing. But Renee, did you have any other comment on that or should we move on to another question? No, I think that's okay. Probably this, this is an interesting question from Ralph Dawson, which is really about some of the tactics, because I think that's important apart from the big picture. You know, how do we get this done? What are the practical advice? And he says, any tips on real, how you get visibility on your suppliers, the contractors, and even the lower tiers of subcontractors and their behaviors? So I think that's a question of asking, you know, what are the practical tips on how you actually get visibility and track this. Now, obviously, Nicholas would say, well, Inform 365 is one, one, one thing you should look at, which, which I agree with. But what, what do you say as a general a comment? Renee, why don't you start us off with that? You know, the, the practical approach of getting that visibility. Yeah, for sure. Um, so we've developed a supplier questionnaire that we actually worked with um, the industry consortium that we developed to have as a consistent questionnaire um, so that any responses that come back can be chosen to be shared with all of us at once. We're getting the same consistent information. And that goes through a number of questions to actually ask what is happening within their supply chain, what um, practices and procedures they have in place to monitor that as well. So we've just started sending those out to our high risk suppliers and then we'll be looking at those from a gap analysis point of view to actually understand where those risks might lie and work with the supplier to address them as well. So there is a little bit of reliance at this early stage for us in terms of the T1 suppliers sort of validating their own supply chain. But I think as we move through, then we'd obviously start looking at those lower tiers ourselves um, and ways to address that specifically. Aaron, Ting Ting, any other comments on that? Yeah. Um, yeah. I feel like <laughs> I got you, you go first, Aaron. <laughs> Uh, sure. I, I was just going to say there's, there's, a two, there's two really crucial parts for us. Um, is One, have, has it been defined in your contractual terms with your suppliers what subcontracting is and what your position is? Um, because without that, you don't have the backing to say, well, yes, this is appropriate or no, it's not. And that's a really key crucial step, particularly to fall back on if you start to want to engage. Um, and similar to Renee, I think the key Next step is don't underestimate the power of asking the question. You know, with the service or product that you provide, do you subcontract this, this portions of work out? Uh, from a Coles perspective, it's outlined in our policies that unless agreed with Coles, subcontracting is not to take place. And that changes the conversation right up front so that suppliers are made aware from the very beginning okay, you know, I can't do 100% of this service or product by myself. I have a 10%, you know, partner down the road that does the rest. I need to flag this. 
Um, so that those are really kind of key things that we've implemented in Shoria are in place to manage that. Yeah, great, great answer. Thanks, Ting Ting. And yeah, I Quick think question. this has always be a really a complicated issue. Like people say, it's easier to map your supply chain down to first tier, second tier. However, when it comes to fourth tier or tier four, tier five supply chains, it's going to be really tricky. And I know that in for some construction uh, companies that are currently operating in the UK, uh, such as a company called Maze, they use an information sharing platform called CDEX to better understand their supply chains, to help them to, you know, to do their supply chain mapping and risk assessment. And uh, one of the uh, leading uh, supply uh, um, material, building material suppliers, called, which is called Marshall, and, and I think they're using a software platform called Vinci platforms to get closer to their supply chains. And also, I know that some uh, big companies, such as Landlease, they actually uh, engage with a third-party um, professional auditor called a Oculus to you know to send out the questionnaires to uh, to map up the uh, supply chains and help them to do the risk assessment yeah so. good mace by the way i think originally started in new zealand you know so i'm uh, i'm glad they've made it all the way to the uk and become successful i think that's right um we've only got two minutes left so one question and i think it'll make we'll keep it uh, very simple justin butcher asked an interesting question um and i think i'd like to hear maybe uh, 50 seconds <laughs> for each three of you which specific modern slavery breaches are the biggest risk to Australian workers? So just as a bit of a summary, in terms of what you see in this local marketplace, Australia, let's call it Australia and New Zealand, um, what are the biggest uh, modern slavery risks? How would you uh, answer that, Renee? To be honest, we're just starting to look at this for ourselves. Um, and I think, you know, there's some high risk industries that definitely um, come out as a general risk around modern slavery, you know, construction, manufacturing, et cetera. Um, but yeah, probably defer to Ting Ting for the expertise on that because we're just working through that at the moment. Yeah, my observation of the workforce, I would agree with you there. Construction, casual workers, and in construction, manufacturing, jobbing, that jobbing sort of environment, I would have thought would be the big risk here in Australia. Offshore in Asia, of course, the clothing industry, the clothing manufacturing industry is is particularly hard. But anyway, Ting Ting, what did what do you think? Uh, yeah, I, I feel like uh, when we talk about modern slavery, some we usually focus on the supply chain risk, you know, the extended supply chain risk. Sometimes we tend to fo uh, ignore the the modern slavery risk in the current operations. And I think due to the impact of COVID-19, you know, especially you know many say many international students they lose their uh, casual jobs or sessional kind of jobs in Australia, you know, it, it may, I would say, lead to significant modern slavery risk maybe during the post-COVID period. I can yeah. imagine the cleaning. Yeah, I know some of my students, yeah. they lost Contract their jobs. Cleaning, yeah. Um, yes, yeah, yeah, that's how I feel. Thanks. Aaron, any last 30 second observation? Yeah, definitely. I, I, I don't like to use the term, but it's that lower skilled labor is, is the big part. So it's anything that you don't need a specific skill set for to be able to complete the work. Um, that's where we see a lot of um, exploitation of vulnerable workers. So whether that's cleaning, you know, gardening, um, it can feed into transport services. There's a level of um, oversight required that's really heavy here labor manual labor hire is probably one of the biggest ones in Australia um, because that's not as scrutinized other depending on what state you're in and, and what legislation they're they're required to abide by from a labor hire perspective um, and there are many initiatives there's still a lot of concern around you know what does labor hire really look like across many industries in Australia great Thank you. Uh, thanks to the panel. Before I hand over to Nicholas and Shane, if they've got any uh, final comments, um, I'd just like to say, you know, I think it's a shared responsibility we all have as consumers, the choices we make uh, as board members to, to, be, to insist that our companies have some sort of system that shows us transparency and that we can see exactly what's going on and hand over heart say, we know, even if we've got 200,000 SKUs, we know with a significant amount of of reliance of where, where those products and services come from. Uh, and I think collectively, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's not,
just a focus on modern slavery, but it's, it's also about a, a much more sustainable planet. So thank you. Thanks for giving up your time. I've really enjoyed being part of it. Uh, and Nicholas, Shane, if you have any final comments. I'd just like to thank everyone. I, I thought it was a, a great session. Um, we are a bit over time, so I won't contribute anything further. And apologies for the audio earlier. Nicholas, did you have anything you wanted to say? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think, Andrew, you summed it up. I think we all have to take responsibility and we have to look at the broader picture. Uh, modern slavery is sort of the pinnacle of it all, but let's start really focusing on social as, as well as environmental aspects. And thanks, everyone, for attending. That was great. And thanks to the panel as well. Really appreciate and it. And thanks to SIPs, those 200,000 supply chain people. We love that. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.